Okay, so yeah, if you buy your clothes, then you're engaged in international trade. So if you start thinking about it, basically, all of us are engaged in international trade every day. Every day. And so when we talk about people such as Trump, who say that they want to encourage the local economy and want to encourage local industry, you wonder what that really means. How can that mean something? Because what we're seeing in the world is that companies are basically dividing themselves, they're, they're dividing their value at a chain across the world in such a way that they can be most efficient. Okay, and so if we look at value added chains of all kinds of products, if we look at, for instance, uh, I want to talk about Nutella. We talk about Nutella, okay? I don't know, I guess all of you have once, at least once in your life, used that product, right? It's a very simple product, right? What is it? Hazelnut chocolate, exactly, to be very precise. In Israel, it's considered a substitute for? Ashachal. Only Israelis can think that. Israeli chocolate, right. But it's only Israelis who can think that. Anyway, Nutella. So we have the hazelnuts. Where do the hazelnuts come from? Where, first of all, what is this product? Where does the product come from? Nutella. It's a? It's an Italian product, exactly. It's an Italian product, but if we look at their value added chain, if we look where they source, okay, let's start there, where they source, then what we see is that, for instance, as already someone who said the hazelnuts come from Turkey, Frida, was that you? Hazelnuts from Turkey? No, nope. no, you didn't know that. Okay, so you didn't say that either. So we have the hazelnuts coming out of Turkey. Turkey is one of the major suppliers in the world of hazelnuts. Okay, if you go to Turkey, next to especially the area next to the Black Sea, a lot of hazelnuts are being grown there. So part of the value added chain actually starts in Turkey with hazelnuts. And then we have Nigeria that su supplies the cocoa, Malaysia, the palm oil, China, the vanilla, Brazil, the sugar. Oh, okay. So you talk about a very simple product that has maybe five or six ingredients all over. It's a simple product, it's a food product, it's a very mature product. If you, we talk about the, the life cycle, you learned the life cycle, the industry life cycle. Someone talked to you about the industry life cycle? Not yet. Okay, so we will talk about it here in class. But if you look at where the product is sourced, even though it's a very simple product, even though there's not really something special about it, you can see that even this product, which is an, originally an Italian product, is basically sourced all over the world. The green, the green circles are the main international suppliers of Nutella. Then as you can see, the factories, which are the triangles, the red triangles, are located in different areas in the world, not necessarily next to the international suppliers of the, of the basic product, of the basic resources. So where are the factories located? Well, some of them, a lot of them actually, are located close to their markets. But why do you think the factories are located close to the end market? What do you think? Maybe to supply them faster, maybe to cut down on logistic costs. Okay, if the product is a mature product, then usually it is difficult to make a profit or a large profit. 
and so you want to cut your costs as much as possible. So we see that basically the, the factories are located in different places and then we have the sales offices which are located in different places again. So even a, a product like Nutella, as you can see, is basically globally sourced. And of course, if we go to products that are uh, more complex, such as smartphones, okay, you can see that the sourcing also becomes even more complex because basically a smartphone will start out as a component, let's say, in maybe in Japan or in Indonesia or Malaysia, okay, and then it may travel to other places and it may also travel back and forth. So we have the components and then the components are create, together create larger parts of the phone and they are assembled into a complete phone and then the phone is marketed or is sent to its destination. Now, in the case of iPhone, when we look at the beginning of the value added chain, where does the value added chain start with smartphones? Where does it start? It doesn't start with sugar and palm oil like it does with Nutella. It starts with? Israel. It starts in Israel with what? With the process, with the R&D. Okay, research and development. So it can start in Israel with research and development, usually not of the whole phone, part of the phone, components of the phone. Okay? It may be that big part of the research and development will take place in the United States. But in the United States, they will only work on the idea. The product will be designed. The product will be developed. There will be 3D images of the product. There may even be a basic... Uh, prototype of the product but once it's being manufactured it's being manufactured in areas in the world where labor is cheaper right because once we talk about the actual manufacturing labor costs become very important and so we see that the product will be marketed will be manufactured in areas where labor is cheaper Okay, so you basically what you can see here, I don't know how well you can see it, but a pro the product may start out in California, travel to Hong Kong, Kuala Lumpur, maybe even to India, go back to Japan, so on and so forth, and then at the end it may end up in Dubai, or even travel back to the United States and end up in New York, in the Apple Store, Flag Store, in New York on Fifth Avenue. Okay, and so the product will have traveled all over the world before it actually has become a product. So when we talk about international trade, basically what we talk about a lot is one, about sourcing. Where do we get our basic ingredients for our product? And as you can see, this is an, it's, it, it's a map of the global um, of the, um, sorry, of uh, global sourcing. So you can see what different countries specialize in. And for instance, what you can see if you look at Africa, Africa, as you can see, specializes in... Okay, so we have oil, we have gold, we have oil here, we have gas, we have uranium, Natural. we have diamonds, we have copper. Cotton. Sorry? Cotton. Cotton, right? Iron ore. Okay. We also have coffee and tea. Okay. So what you can see that especially Africa has a lot of raw materials that, by the way, are partly used in iPhones. And smartphones. Smartphones use gold. Smartphones use all kinds of special metals that are sourced in Africa. Okay, so you see that Africa is really specializing in resources that, that come out of the soil, that come out of the, the actual land. 
and so natural resources. And what is happening among others is that com countries like China are now investing heavily in Africa because in order to be an electronic equipment and machinery manufacturer, which nowadays characterizes China, it needs to source materials from Africa. And so what you're seeing is that China is investing heavily in Africa. They're buying out mines and all kinds of land in order to own these materials. But not only that, infrastructure in, in Africa is very, very bad. So actually China is now building the infrastructure in Africa Exactly, roads and ports in order. So when they mine for oil or for gold or for uranium or whatever, it has to get to a harbor somewhere. And in order to get to a harbor, you need a road. And so what you see at the moment is that China is actually developing Africa. So there are, there are hundreds of thousands of Chinese working in Africa, building roads, building ports, building airports, building infrastructure which is lacking in Africa. Okay, so that is how, by the way, Africa benefits, and you can discuss if that's beneficial or not, but what is happening at the moment is that Africa is actually benefiting from development of the global value-added chain. Okay, if China would not be sourcing in Africa, it would not be building an infrastructure in, China, in Africa. Um, We are food and drink here? We are electronics. No, no, we are this one, electronics. Here we are, you know, it's a, it's blue, blue. No, no, it's, it's blue, light blue. Okay, so, and so China's electronic equipment and machinery. However, if you look at the value added chain, you can see, you, for instance, you compare us to China, we're in the same group or the same category or the same color group. However, one of the problems that China has is that they're at the lower end of electronics and machinery. So they don't develop, they don't research, mainly they build the first parts and the lower part of the value added chain. So one of the things that China and Chinese government is trying to do is to actually upgrade China and have it develop or have it manufacture more complex products. So when we talk about more complex products, we actually go here. And as you can see, Finland is also in electronics. Ireland, okay. Uh, sorry? Yeah, China, we said China. Uh, no, not really, it's the Philippines here. Okay, then we have um, we have Australia with coal. We have dairy products from New Zealand, exactly. Soybeans from South America, and of course we have capital goods, United States clothing and shoes from Mexico. Motor vehicles and ports. Actually, that is also one of the things that. Trump is talking all the time about Mexico taking away jobs from the automotive industry. But if you look at the data, a lot of the automotive industry actually moved to Canada already many years ago. And Canada is a major supplier of motor parts of the, mo of the, of the automotive industry. Okay, then we have here fish and fish products. And... Um, and so on and so forth. Also, of course, also Russia is a big supplier, not only of petroleum, but also of all kinds of precious metals, diamonds, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what we can see here is that for a lot of companies, when they look at the world map, actually this is what they see. They ask themselves where to source which parts of the value-added chain. Okay, so when we talk about trade, we basically talk about looking at the world in terms of where can I 
execute different parts of my activities, of my organizational activities, in such a way that I'm more efficient than other companies. So a lot about international business and international trade is about this, about understanding where your opportunities lie, not only as a market, but a lot of it is about manufacturing and developing. Okay? Because when we talk about making a profit at the end of the day, a lot of it is about lowering your costs. Okay, so that, so that is the, the, the story when we talk about international trade. Okay, so when we talk about international trade, basically, sorry, basically what we talk about is the global value chain, which includes all of the people and all of the organizations that are involved in the production of a good or a service. And what we see is that firms try to optimize their production processes by locating various stages of the value added chain across different sites and countries. Okay? And so again, as said, all of us are engaged in international trade. There are very few products nowadays in the world, especially in the developed world, that are manufactured locally, totally locally. Can you give an example of a product that is still a totally local product? Vegetables. Sorry? Vegetables. No. Vegetables. Vegetables is too wide of a definition. Why is that? Because we do um, the machinery of bring in some vegetables and we also export vegetables. Okay, so, so we import and export yeah. vegetables. What else? The machinery that we use is usually manufactured outside Israel. Okay, what else? Tequila. Sorry? Tequila. tequila? No, we're on vegetables still. <laughs> then we'll talk about tequila. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe still on <laughs> just the evening. Um, okay, so vegetables, try to narrow it down. No, try to narrow down the vegetables. Be more specific to give an Israeli, really Israeli product within the vegetable group. Exactly. Cherry tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are really an Israeli product. Why is that? Because Israel developed them and has a patent on cherry tomatoes. Israel is actually considered one of the leading countries in the world in the development of tomatoes. Okay, we're considered very advanced in tomato development and also if you go to <coughs> countries like Russia. Russia or Italy or Spain, they'll be growing Israeli tomatoes. Okay, so the tomatoes of course will be grown locally, but the technology is Israeli technology. Okay, so tomatoes are really an Israeli product because the technology basically is an Israeli technology. So even when we talk about vegetables nowadays, we talk about technology. Most of the vegetables that we uh, purchase, that we use, that we buy, are designed. They are not vegetables that just happen to grow in our back garden. They are designed for shelf life, they're designed for color, they're designed for, for a form, for taste. Okay, so most of the vegetables that we purchase are designed vegetables. And not all the design is done in Israel. But tomatoes, especially cherry tomatoes, we are really leading in the world in tomatoes. Leaders. And farmers all over the world buy the technology. Okay, tequila. Tequila is a local Israeli product. No. Mm -hmm. It's a local. Mex er every type of tequila? It has to be produced in Mexico, but does it have to be? The whole value added chain is Mexican? That's a good question. You're not sure, okay. We have a lot of development of, um, my husband's work 
Okay, Ministry of Agriculture. Yeah, and they have development of, uh, of animals. They develop animals? What they kind of sheep animals? Sheep that can give birth to twins. Okay, sheep that can give birth to twins they and? Grow more um, faster growing. Oh, that grow faster? Okay. Yeah, and they, they do IVF for sheep. Huh? I'm seeing them IVF. I'm seeing them can. Okay, and so. They have the thing is, though, sheep are not really an Israeli product. So probably that knowledge is exported to Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. places where sheep or, or Britain, where sheep are grown. We don't really have a sheep industry in Israel. They sell the patent. Okay. Yeah, they sell the patent. But I'm asking about products that are totally local. Can you give me an example? Of Sabres. <laughs> sabres that, okay, sabres that grow <laughs> somewhere along the road. Okay, okay. Services, very good. So services, more than products, are still quite local. Exactly. Can you give me an example? <laughs> Difficult to find an example, but yes, you are right. Services are more difficult to manufacture internationally than products. Because products, we don't need to be there. We can send the product by itself across the world. The problem with services, what is the problem with services? The language. The language, what more? Let's think about it a little bit in wider terms. Why is it difficult to internationalize services? Anyone, why is it so difficult to internationalize services? Sorry? Okay, that's what more or less what Jan said as well. Language, culture, what else? We need the Okay, but what do you want to say? We need to send people overseas. You need to send people overseas. Okay, one of the things is that services as opposed to products, can usually not be created as products that we can put on a shelf and they wait until they're purchased. A service usually is manufactured together with the client and sold at that same point of time. Okay? So while, while we are getting better at manufacturing services without direct interaction with our clients, most services still need the interaction with our clients. Ways. Sorry? Ways. Ways. Okay. It's based on interaction, interaction with the users in real time. It also doesn't, I mean, you can, you can store the data from yesterday, but what does that matter? If you have a road accident now, it doesn't matter what the, conditions of the road were yesterday. So it has to be here and now. But that is yeah. Sorry? Oh, they well, it is it's not, it's, it is so internationalized. It's, it's internationalized, but it's specific for each country. For each country, right. When you drive from Rishon Lezion to Tel Aviv, no. you don't really care about the road conditions in Amsterdam or in New York at that point of time. Okay, you may be in a week time, you may be in Amsterdam, and then you will use ways to understand what the conditions are in Amsterdam. But again, services cannot be manufactured for the future. A service is manufactured and used at the same time. Like planes. Like planes, for instance, the plane will take off with or without having sold all the seats. That is also why you can get very cheap seats on flights when you wait until the last minute. Okay, because then basically every dollar they get for a seat is more than they'll get if they just take off. The same goes for hotels. Okay, so services are managed in a very different way from 
products from tangible products. A tangible product I can basically manufacture ahead of time, put on a shelf, and sell afterwards. With a service, we cannot do that. Okay, we cannot say, okay, tonight we have sold only 50 rooms, so the other 50, let's put them aside and, have, and let's wait for the weekend. Then for sure we'll be able to sell those 50 rooms, but that is, of course, not possible. So services behave different from products, from tangible products, and therefore their value added chain usually is much more local because you need the interaction with your client or with your user in real time to sell or to use the service. Okay, but also in services we're seeing internationalization. So, one of the industries that has been very successful in globalizing their value-added chain is actually the fast fashion industry and we talked already about fast fashion um, <clears throat> just to remind you fast fashion what is fast fashion about fast fashion it's it's actually a part of the in fashion industry what is fast fashion about it's very s similar to fast food trends. it's about trends cheap clothes. it's about cheap clothes Easy access, right? Easy disposal. Changing environments. Changing, changing environments. Okay. So fast fashion, which is something that developed the last 10 years or so, is basically about impulse buying. It's very similar to, as I said before, fast food. It's about going into a store 20 times a year, 30 times a year to purchase something that is fashionable here and now, and probably will not be fashionable in half a year or a year time. So while fashion used to be about four um, collections a year, you would have two major collections, you would have a summer collection and a winter collection, and you would have two small collections, you would have a fall collection, you would have a spring collection. That's how fashion behaved for many years. Nowadays in the fashion industry there are those that specialize in fast fashion, they basically they have new collections every two weeks. So if you go into H&M or if you go into Zara or Castro or one of the local or international fashion chains, basically every two weeks you'll have new products on the shelf. So fast fashion is about very high turnover. It's about... Um, incremental innovation it's about presenting new products all the time throughout the year and it's also very much about understanding where the market is going but understanding where the market is going in terms of days and weeks okay if you think about the value-added chain of the fashion industry where does it start idea. sorry idea. The, the fashion industry, the fast fashion industry, where does the, their value-added chain start? Not in which country, but, but with what kind of activities do you think it starts with? Making Sorry, making clothes. But where does that start? Designing. designing them. Now, the thing is with fast fashion, do you think they really design themselves? No. No. What do they do? Well, they copy. They're great at copying, but in order to be successful in copying, you have to understand what is fashionable at this point in time. And example, Sorry? Zara. Zara is a very good example. I have to ask you, did I show you the clip on Zara? No. Did you see it last semester? Okay, so I, I agree. Zara is a very, very good example. Can you tell me why you think Zara is a good example? Right. The best brands, we can even see that they really are similar. Yeah, so they copy, right, they copy from the major brands. Mm -hmm. And uh, they basically sell them to people that can't afford 
Uh, right. And, uh, so just to make sure that we know what we're talking about, a dress from Dolce Gabbana can cost $10,000, but let's say a cheap dress can cost $4,000. So you can get a nearly identical dress from Zara for maybe 400 shekels. Okay? Zara is, I think, the champion in fast fashion, in, in, in knowing, in understanding which trends are trending at this point in time, and then manufacturing those trends within a very, very short period of time. So Zara, by the way, Zara is an interesting company. It was founded in 1975. It, was, uh, it had its first uh, IPO, initial public offering, in 2001. It's a Spanish company, but it's active all over the world. And it's growing at an increasingly high pace. Okay. By the way, Zara is part of a company called Inditex, and we'll see in a moment which other companies belong to Inditex. But let's start with, let me see if this is the one that I want to show you first. So part of the game is, as you say, copying. Um, not using your own designs, but basically... China is built on copying. Uh, basically taking someone else's design and manufacturing it quicker, cheaper, easier, and distributing it throughout your chain of stores in a more efficient way. Yes, um, that, you know, that, that brings us to the question, what is ethical, why ethics are important in, in business, uh, what kind of business do we want to be? Uh, these are questions that you should all, all ask yourself, because basically what Zara is saying, and, and we're talking about a European company, we're not talking about, we're talking about a company located in Spain, part of the EU, part of the developed world, part of the developed world that should know how to behave ethically. But if you look at fast fashion, very similar, by the way, to fast food. Fast food also is not about designing food. It's not about creating that special experience for your palette or for your, for your um, uh, food experience. It's about taking basically someone else's recipes and creating basic food. Okay, so if you start looking at it and and what you say, China, it's exactly what China does. It's exactly what Turkey does. I mean, if you look at a lot of businesses around the world, they don't do so much research and development or design. What they do is take existing products and create a cheaper, more efficient version of that product. And so a country like, and that's, that's also an interesting an interesting question. You know, last week, I don't know if you remembered, we talked about the resource-based view. Okay, and we, we talked about what are we, what every one of us is good at, especially. We talked about that at the individual level, at the company level, and at the country level. Okay, one of the things that Israel is very good at is, what is Israel really good at? Technology. Technology development. Sorry? Teva. Teva. Teva, Teva exactly. Company. Exactly, I agree generic totally. Is yeah. A nice word for uh, generic means uh, that the product is not anymore protected by a patent, and so you can copy it, and that is exactly what Teva does. It's the biggest copier in the world of pharmaceuticals. But Israel is also very good at research and development, right? That is what Israel is really good at when you talk about electronics. Which part of the value added chain are we really good at? At the beginning of the value added chain, the research and development. We're not that good at manufacturing. That's one of the reasons we don't manufacture in Israel. We may develop and manufacture some components, but we don't manufacture end products in Israel because we're not good enough as compared to other countries at manufacturing. We're very good at research and development. 
the thing about research and development, and that is very similar to what happens in fashion and design, a lot about it is running faster than your competition. And so your window of opportunity, if you're an innovator in research and development, in design, or whatever it may be, if you're an innovator, the one that designs, develops, researches, then your window of opportunity is basically that time between you putting out on the market your design and having others imitate your design. That is your window of opportunity. And so if you talk about companies like Dolce & Gabbana, their window of opportunity is exactly there. It's those few weeks that they can present their products before they're being copied by Zara, H&M, and so on and so forth. By the way, H&M does exactly the same like Zara. You can discuss if they're as successful or not, but they do exactly the same. Okay, and so do a lot of the other fast fashion companies. So when we talk about fast fashion, what are fast fashion companies good at especially? What do you get take away from that? What are companies like Zara really good at? Manufacturing fast. Manufacturing fast, exactly. They are very good at manufacturing fast and at a lower price. Okay? So it's a, once about fast manufacturing and once it's about doing it at a very, in a very efficient way or a low price. How does Zara do that? What do you think? They copy, and then where do they manufacture? If manufacturing is so important, where do they do that? In Europe. Okay, where in Europe? Why East Europe? It's cheaper. Okay, why don't they manufacture, for instance, in China, Malaysia? The quality is there. The quality, and what else? The time is there, longer shipment. Exactly, time, logistics. Okay, so it's not only about direct labor cost. It is also about the logistics. It's also about how long does it take me to ship back to headquarters to have the quality assurance and to ship it out again. So a lot about a lot of the questions. So Zara, basically, a company like Zara, basically, what it's really good at is one, spotting the right trends, two, knowing how to translate those trends into fast, cheap products, which they know how to manufacture very quickly. They know how to distribute very quickly to their stores. And all Zara stores are owned by Zara. Why is that? So why does Zara have their own stores? Why don't they sell through third parties? What do you think? They have their logo. They have their? They have their logo. What else? Why do you think Zara has its own stores, They're its more proprietary more stores? They're more in control. They're more into control. What are they in control of? Prices. Prices. What else? They can give it uh, at the end to the customer the lowest prices. Okay, so they can give low prices to the customer. What else? They know the customers will keep on coming back. Sorry? They know that will keep on coming back. They know that will keep on coming back. What else? It was actually mentioned in the... Oh, yeah. So people worry and they don't buy it, so they send it back to the checkpoint. Right, exactly. So, so a lot of the feedback they get about trending is actually from their stores. So they know exactly which, which items are tried on more, which items are tried on less. They know what sells and what doesn't sell in terms of size, in terms of color in terms of design and they use that feedback on a daily basis to adjust their production processes. So if you ask what Zara is good at, probably very good at, among others, it's managing their information system. They have a really good information system. All their stores and all their cash registers are actually in communication, real-time, online, with headquarters. 
and headquarters in Spain analyzes all those data on a daily basis. And based on those data, they make manufacturing decisions on a daily basis. So if you ask, what is Zara really good at besides trending, besides manufacturing efficiently, they're really good at data management. They're extremely good at data management. And their point of sale system is very, very efficient. Okay, so Zara, if you ask how come Zara is so successful, well, those are parts of the equation. As you see, what is not really part of the equation is design. So while we're talking about a fashion company, we're talking about a company that manufactures, that creates fashion, that some of you go into maybe 20 times a year to see what is trending in the industry. Okay, despite all those facts, they don't do design. They do data management, they do logistics, they do manufacturing. That's what they're really good at. Okay? So when, what I'm trying to show you is that when you, when you think about what we talked about last week, about resource-based uh, view, about thinking what you're really good at, you can see that even a company such as Zara, which is a so-called fashion company, basically if you ask yourselves what are they really good at, they're really good at just some parts of the value added chain, which gives them an edge compared to their competitors. So that is what allows them to compete internationally so successfully. Now, as said before, Zara is part of Inditex. Do you know which other companies are part of Inditex? Anyone? Okay, so all these companies are part of Inditex. Okay, they're all owned by the same owners. So we have Zara, we have Bershka, Massimo Dutti, Pull&Bear, Uterki. All those are companies owned by Inditex. So when you go, next time when you go shopping and you go from Zara to Bershka to Pull&Bear, basically you're buying from the same company. Okay, even though they're branded differently, it's exactly the same manufacturer. And why do they have so many different brands? Why, what do you think, what is the reason behind so many different brands? People like to change. Mechanical. People like to change. What else? Sorry, different values for the consumer, okay. Stradivarius is more for the younger, cheaper. Okay, so basically what did Inditex do? They, exactly, they segmented the market and created brands for different market segments. But having said that, at the end of the day, it's the same company making a profit. So while we, the customers, may think that we buy from different companies, basically this company Inditex can own maybe even up to half of a shopping center or own at least the market <coughs> of about half of a shopping center and just serve different market segments. Do you wanted to say something, Frida? I'm not buying from Bershka because I will not buy from Zara. I'm buying because they have different clothes. Exactly. Even though it's the same, they're all under the same company, they have different designs. Of course, they have different designs because they target oh, different exactly. market segments. And that's why... Different age groups, artists. different socioeconomic status, exactly. And they're not the same um, prices. They're not the same prices, they're not the same designs, they are not targeting the same type of customers, on the other hand. Yeah. Being a business student, you should know that they all belong to the same company. So well, w when we are business students, we try to understand business strategies. 
So we try to look at companies not only through the eyes of the customer, but also through the eyes of how can I be an efficient and effective ma uh, manager. Okay, and so Inditex decided that the best way to go is to actually try and own the market. Okay, so the whole idea of global value chain is something that has really developed the last 10 years or so. Reasons are, among others, technology, logistics. There are much more opportunities nowadays for international communication, for international travel of products, of components. And so basically this whole global value added chain is, is, is a new, rather new notion. It is growing very fast. On the other hand, what you should take into account that while we think it's a global phenomenon, actually if we look at the data, it's, it's very uneven. And there are, there are countries that can take part in and grow and develop and succeed based on the development of the global value chain. And there will be other countries that have a lot of difficulties participating in the global value added chain. For instance, for instance, if the mother company is, for instance, an American company, okay, the mother company is an American company traded on, the American, on an American bourse, let's say New York Stock Exchange. That means that the investors in that company want a company that is ethical and that behaves ethically, meaning that you want that the parts of the value added chain are manufactured in an ethical way. You don't want to have a product, maybe you, don't, you, you say, I'm not going to buy a t-shirt that was manufactured by kids that are 10 years old and chained to a sewing machine. So I'm, I'm not going to be part of such an industry. I'm not going to buy a product that was manufactured in such a way. I'm not going to buy a product that was manufactured in a factory where people are exploited 16 hours a day, okay? Maybe in Israel we're somewhat less aware of these kind of phenomena, even though we are, if you look for instance at the food industry, Israel today is considered one of the leading countries in the world in uh, veganism, okay? So when you look at the food industry, for instance, Israeli, the Israeli customer is very, very aware of the value added chain. And a lot of people in Israel, especially younger people, are not willing anymore to, to partake in the meat industry and in industries that exploit animals in all kinds of ways. And young people have, to, so many young people in Israel decide that they're not eating that food anymore. Okay, so, so in Israel we have it in the food industry. In the United States you'll see it more in the textile industry, in the apparel industry. Uh, and maybe in other countries you'll see it in other industries, but basically customers in the Netherlands, for instance, it's very important to have green, uh, green products. So a lot of people will not buy products that were manufactured in a way that is, um, doesn't, that, that will uh, affect the environment in a negative way. So we see that consumers, customers, users, implement their values on the products that they are willing to buy or not. Meaning that if the product somewhere down the line is manufactured under unethical conditions, people will not buy that product. Okay, and so countries that are low on ethical values, countries that are developing that allow exploitation of other people, that allow exploitation of natural resources and so on. These are countries that have more difficulties being part of the global value added chain. Okay, there is a very nice example of, um, uh, in the beer industry, there's the Dutch beer company called Heineken. You have, may have heard of it, it's one of the bigger competitors in beer. Of course, there's the Danish Carlsberg and there's the Dutch Heineken. These are two big European beer companies. Um, 
one of the markets or, or, or few of the markets that are growing still in beer in this in, in European beers is Asia the Asian market is still growing so there is a, an increasing demand for European beers in Asian markets in Asian markets, beers basically are sold by means of beer ladies. What are beer ladies? Ladies are standing in. Sorry? Like the waitress. They're like waitresses, exactly. They are like waitresses. So. <laughs> oh, sorry? Wearing short clothes. They wear short clothes, short, short skirts, revealing shirts. So the beer ladies in Asia, they work in the bars and cafes and so on. And they basically try to encourage men to purchase a certain uh, brand of beer. Okay, and they usually also, they sit and drink with the men. Well, what happened is that these, these women, of course, at the end of the evening, many times they're assaulted yeah. by drunk men and they're raped and they, their lives are really very unpleasant. And they go to work the next day. Or and they go to work the next day, day because they don't have much choice. I mean, it's either working as a beer lady or not working, which many times is the choice in developing countries. It's either working demeaning work or, or not working. And then how do you feed your children? So anyway, what happened uh, with, with Heineken is that the Dutch investors and the Dutch customers learned, in time learned about behavior of the beer ladies and what happens to beer ladies. And they started pressurizing Heineken to clean up their act. And they said, we're not going to be, so Dutch customers said, we're not going to buy Heineken products anymore if that's the way Heineken sells its products in Asia. Okay? And investors said very similar things. And so Heineken actually started cleaning up its act and started changing the way it sells beer in Asia. So while there is no direct relationship between selling beer in the Netherlands and selling beer in Asia, you can see how customers and investors will affect the way you do business. And so back to global value added chain, what happens is in many instances, as you may remember with Apple, when there was the whole scandal about how people in one of the factories that are suppliers of Apple components, how they are mistreated and that there is a lot of suicide in those factories because of mistreatment. It affected Apple's sales in the United States. Okay, so what we're seeing with this whole global value added chain, that while, while the process, the value chain is dispersing internationally, you see that those countries that are relatively poor and have, um, have also institutions that are not very strong, okay? Don't have very strong police, don't have very strong law system. Those are the countries that are again losing because at the end of the day, a lot of the Western customers say, we're not going to purchase products that are manufactured under such conditions. So each company is basically looking for ways to increase its ethical status. Okay. Um, Again, at the end of the day, this is, a pr this is a huge report that was created in 2013. And it looked at um, how involved com countries are in global value chain activities and how much those activities contribute to the country's GDP. And basically what you can see is that FDI FDI means foreign direct investment. I think we talked about that term, foreign direct investment. Basically means how much a country invests in another country or how much is invested in the home country. What you can see is that there is a very high correlation between the different, the different uh, aspects. And at the end of the days, countries that have low FDI also have low participation in the global value chain. So it's 
they lose out again. So again, being a developing country is not an easy position to be in. So having talked about countries and global value chain, which country is the biggest exporter in the world? Is it the USA, Germany, China, or Japan? China, right, you are right. And now I'll ask you another question. Who is the biggest importer? It is the USA. Which okay. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully, Trump is hoping he's going to change and it's all going to be in house. Right. If he changes. Is that relevant or can that be done? Can, can the USA become the biggest exporter in the world? Okay, so Trump wants to lower the import yes. and create more products in-house. Is that really, do you think that is realistic? No. Ricardo wouldn't agree with that. Sorry? Ricardo. <laughs> Ricardo. <laughs> Ricardo would agree with that. Okay. Is it relevant? Is it, is it realistic? Why not? You need to be interconnected. Okay, why, Frida, do you think it is possible? Because one, he has four or five years to do it. Yes. Two, he can do it. There is enough space in the USA. Okay, space. But what more do you need besides space to have? To bring all the cheap, companies cheap to do it. You need cheap labor or, or? To upgrade the prices. Or, exactly, or increase prices. Okay, if everything is going to be manufactured in the U.S., first of all, you need labor force that knows... But there is labor force because there's so many... But people. what kind of labor force do you need? People that will well. work for cheap labor because they have... People that will work for, for low wages in factories. Okay, what are... He's targeting. His only reason to do it is to give people work. Places. Okay, to give people work. But what is low wage in the United States? Okay, it doesn't matter how much it is, no, but... but an article that McDonald's workers get like $5 an hour or something. So okay, so it's, it's about... Know. Okay, but the, the thing is that the United States has minimum wages, right? It may be 5 or $7 an hour. Okay, what do you think is minimum wage in Indonesia? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Like half a dollar. Maybe half a dollar a day. <laughs> Is there minimum wage in, in Indonesia? There is no minimum wage in Indonesia. Maybe there is on paper, but it's not implemented. Okay, so let's say that a t-shirt can be manufactured for half a dollar in Indonesia. That same t-shirt will be five dollars in the United States, manufacturing cost. Okay, and then by the time it becomes a t-shirt that you are going to buy in a store, how much will that t-shirt cost, do you think? A lot more, but again, we're talking oh. about ethics. Of course, you can make it for half a dollar, but it's not ethical. Okay, it's not ethical, but now let's go back to those people that earn $5 a, uh, an hour. Okay, the minimum wagers that are working in a factory and now can afford to buy a t-shirt for $2 or $3. These people are not going to buy t-shirts for $30, which will cost, which will be the cost of a t-shirt made in the US. Okay, so, so the question is, maybe you'll create work, but before you create work, what do you need? You need people that, are, that have the skill set to work in the factories. So you have to educate them. Okay, most people that don't work in the United States, what, what is their status or what is their demographic and their social demographic? Homeless, not educated. Homeless, not educated, maybe not homeless, but a lot of them will be uh, non-educated, mothers, unmarried mothers, young unmarried mothers, uneducated. So first of all, you have to educate them. Most of them don't have the skill set to work in, even in factories, okay? So you have to educate and that will take a few years. 
then you have to subsidize companies in order to encourage them to move their factories into the US, right? Then probably you'll have to subsidize the manufacturing process. Okay? And even then, competition will be very hard because you're going to compete with your $30 t-shirt with a $3 t-shirt unless Trump decides to close the borders, which doesn't sound really realistic. Okay, so the whole notion of trying to create local products down the, the um, product life cycle, industry life cycle, is really not relevant. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do it, you have to start with education. And education is a long-term process. It's not something that you can create in three years or in five years. By the way, I think Trump uh, changed his mind of thinking about globalization because, and because he started to, you can see in the news that he actually uh, meted uh, the prime minister of China. Yes, and, uh, yes. They he talk and they and got yeah. Those okay, so Trump is starting to get. Yeah. He's he's being introduced into international business 101. He's getting to understand the basics of international business, and he understands that international business is actually a backbone for the American economy. Okay, well, um, okay, let's pass quickly through that. We set technology. Um, okay, so if we just look at who the top, exporters are. Um, what is interesting to see is that in 1995 Japan was an important force in international trade and if we look at 2014, 20 years later Japan has stepped out of the game and basically we have China. So and you still have Germany and the United States as major players. So that is also another aspect of Trump saying, OK, I want to localize everything. By localizing American manufacturing, it also means it's not going to ex export as much as it has been exporting so far. So it will also, and usually what you export is what you know how to manufacture. So it's going to affect the United States in many, many different ways. But anyway, what we see here is that Germany and the United States are top exporters in the world. Okay? And what you can also see is that that, that trade, that international trade, has grown tremendously over the last 20 years. It just, if you look at how the situation was in 1995, and you look at 2014, and the expectation, by the way, is that it's going to continue growing in as fast as we see here. So basically the assumption is that trade is going to be totally international. We will have very little local, totally local manufacturing processes, be it services and be it products. Okay, um, what we can also see is that there are different countries that have uh, joined the game while well, in 1995, and it's very difficult to see here, but 90% um, of all international trade was done by developed countries. Basically, 20 years later, yeah, only 50, about 50%, a little bit more than 50% of all international trade is by developed countries. And as you can see, the developing countries are really starting to be major players in international trade. And within the developing countries, it's mostly Asian countries. Okay, so Asia really has started to be part of this international game the last 20 years and is expected to continue um, participating in international trade. We talked a little bit about services. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is that, one, the world today 
is based on international trade. There is no way you can isolate a country unless you're like North Korea or so. I think North Korea is the only country in the world, more or less. Or Venezuela is also a good example of countries that are really not involved in international trade. Sorry? No, they're not involved in international trade. So th their, political, their political leaders basically decided that the country is not involved in international trade. And if we look at the data, and we'll, we'll look at the data next week, we also will see that countries that are not involved in international trade are basically countries that are not doing well. They are, their populations are poor. In Venezuela, they uh, still uh, reach you kids. Did you know that? The uh -huh. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I met some of them. You met some <laughs> of the... It's really funny. It's like they used to that. <coughs> kidnap them, and then the, their parents, like, pay the... The ransom? The ransom. Okay. Because Venezuela is a very, very poor country. Yeah. And it's not involved so much in international trade, even though they have a lot of oil. Yeah. Oil. And still, despite the fact that it's a country that is rich in oil, it's still a very poor country because it's not involved in international trade. It's like one dollar to fill up your car. Yeah. yeah. But the thing is, you can fill up your car with, with, with benzene. The thing is, though, they don't have anything to eat, more or less. They don't have cars. And they don't have cars, yeah. Why don't, them, why don't they just sell the oil? Uh, they do sell the oil, but it's, uh, it's the... the Political system is such. We'll have a look next week at Venezuela, Venezuela, and understand what is what is the problem there. Maybe some. Okay, so let's just go over some key terms that are part and parcel of international trade. When we talk international trade, then basically what we talk about is exporting and importing. Um, and one of the things, we'll also see that next week, one of the problems we have with importing and exporting is that because the value chain has become global, actually a product in its different stages will be imported and exported a number of times, maybe even into the same country. And one of the things we don't know how to do is to count that right. So every time a product, even if it's a half-finished product, moves across a border, it is counted. Okay, so the same product can be counted maybe 10 times if it's a, like an iPhone that is manufactured all over the world. So exporting and importing, basically what you want as a country, what you want is that you export more than that you import. Okay, if you export more than you import, you have a trade surplus. If you import more than you export, you have trade deficiency. In the United States, for instance, imports more than exports nowadays. We have merchandise. Merchandise are products, products that are tangible, that we can touch. We have services. We said that services are more difficult to trade internationally, even though that is changing. One of the biggest changes made in the world around international trade and service was actually the creation of the European Union. I don't know how if you have taken a course on the European Union and what happened is when the European Union was created, do you know when it was created, the European Union? In 1992, the European was, Union was created. It used to be the European Economic Community, EEC, and in 1992, or better said on the 1st of January 1993, it became the European Union. More countries were added to it over the time. It's a big group of countries that have that agreement among them. And what makes it so special as compared to most other trade agreements that exist in the world is that the trade is, that it's not only free trade of goods. Israel, by the way, has, put your phones away. Israel has, free trade agreements with lots of countries in the world. What does a free trade agreement mean? So what does free no trade tax. mean? No taxes on what? On, uh, merchandise. On, on merchandise. Services, no services, no 
exactly. Not necessarily services, but it's usually it's on merchandise. The, the big difference between free trade agreement, which usually only addresses merchandise and lack of taxes, the European Union actually said there will be free movement, not only free trade, but free movement of people, of services and of goods. Now, that, the, the people and the services, that's the big thing about the European Union. And that's what makes the European Union so special because it basically means that, for instance, when you study in Germany and get your degree in Germany and you become, let's say, a physician in Germany, you finish your studies in Germany, you can go to Italy and open up a clinic in Italy without having to pass exams or without having to get a new license or whatever. Okay, so that is free movement of people people basically in the European Union can move freely across borders and sell their services or their hours of labor wherever they want in the European Union. So that is why, for instance, after Poland was added to the European Union, suddenly three million Polish people ended up in the UK selling their skills in the UK, okay? Because that is what means to have free movement of people. So people are actually moving across borders and are able to sell their services and their skills wherever they want. So all of you that have European passports, that is also one of the reasons we saw the surge in Israelis trying to get European passports, because it basically means not only they can study wherever you want within the European <coughs> Union. Afterwards, you can live wherever you want and work wherever you want without having to get any additional um, legal papers to do so. So that is a huge change, okay? Free movement of people, free movement of services. That is also something very special. It basically means that I live in the Netherlands, and I know that electricity in Spain is cheaper. I can buy electricity from Spain rather than from the Netherlands. How does that work? Well, very similar to how the cellular companies in Israel work. You know, all the new cellular companies that were opened in Israel last few years, they didn't build infrastructures. They basically ride on the infrastructure that already exists. And the same goes with electricity. Okay, or any type of other service. Let's say you want banking services. You live in Italy, but you want your banking services from Germany. You can buy your banking services from Germany. Okay, without any problems. So that is a really a huge, huge change. Just imagine that you can buy all your services wherever you want in, within the European Union. Okay. So it's not only about studying, it's not only about working, it's also about purchasing services. And so what you see in Europe is that the services are now really becoming international. And then you have all kinds of questions. How do you internationalize services? Which is a totally different question than how do you internationalize manufacturing? They pay taxes on the... Yeah, you pay taxes in your home country. The country pays taxes to your European Union. And you pay the taxes to your but you pay your taxes in your local, in, in the country that you live in. Even if you go work or study or anything? No, if you live in another country, if you move to another country, you'll pay your taxes in that other country, although there are all kinds of tax agreements between countries. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how long you're going to live in another country and if you take your family or not. And but for students, one of the things that happened with students in the European Union, that you see that students in the European Union study internationally. And you will see there, there are all kinds of agreements now between universities in, the, in Europe, where people will study for half a year in the Netherlands, and then go for six weeks to the UK, and then go to Poland, and then go... Where, and it's all those studies, wherever you take them in Europe, are accepted for credit. 
Okay, and so that is exactly what you see if you have European friends studying in Europe. They don't study just at one university, they study all over. And there are so many agreements now that allow that. So, so when we talk about the European Union, that is really the biggest experiment of lowering, hello, of lowering <laughs> barriers to trade. Okay, so, so that is really the world that we're moving into. And, and even though there is a big backlash at the moment taking place all over Europe, and a lot of the talk about Marie Le Pen being elected in France, and the same you see in Austria, and you have in the Netherlands, UK exiting the EU, all those um, behaviors or all those phenomena are actually a sort of a backlash to opening of the borders. Because who are the people who really benefit from opening of borders? Who, who do you think? Which people do really benefit from opening of borders? The smart ones, the ones who have education and what we called last week a broad resource base. Why? Why the smart ones? Well, it's, I wouldn't say it's not necessarily the smart ones, but it's the people who have a large resource base. So, so the more knowledge you have, the more education you have, the easier it is for you to sell your capabilities, your experience, or whatever you do, to sell them wherever in the world. Okay, if you're not educated, then your job opportunities are very limited. And if you're not educated, you will not usually speak languages, different languages, which you do need to work in other countries. You don't have international experience, you don't have an international network. But it's yep. not always true. It's not always true. Because a lot of people that don't study take the time and uh, do that thing. Do what thing? Let, uh, go, yeah, study languages, go abroad, uh, do business with other people. A and lot. No, not many. No. But not uh, many, exactly. Well, the problem is the world look at that um, title if you have a degree or not. That's the problem. Well. It's part of when we talked last week, when we talked about a resource base, that every one of us builds a resource base. We really talked about all those aspects. So there are also people who don't have a formal education, but have a wide network and do speak languages and so on and so forth, and for some reason don't have a formal education. But these are the exceptions to the rule. Okay? Most people who did not finish high school don't have the capability don't have the tools to study, be it formal and be it informal. Okay? We were talking last, I forgot your name, German guy. Your name? Mickey. Mickey. So we were talking last week, you were telling me about your German friends who mostly continue living in the same village or same city they were brought up in. They learn a trade, they learn to be bakers, or they learn to be auto mechanics, or whatever, whatever. And that is what they know how to do. That's what they know. So let's say you, let's say you learned how to be an auto mechanic for Mercedes. Then you will find work in Germany at a Mercedes factory or service provider. But let's say you want now to move to France. There are no factories of Mercedes in France, you don't speak French, you don't know anyone in France. With the connection what kind of connection? You have. As you said, Mickey, they lived their whole lives in the same city, in the same village, That's their, their connection, yeah, but that is what most of the people in the world, that is what they have. Okay, you look at your, the little bubble that you live in and you think that represents the whole world. But most people are not like you. You're the exception to the rule. If you look statistically, you here in class, you're the exceptions to the rule. Okay? Most people are not like you are. The more you'll travel, the more you'll see that most people are not like you. Most people don't have what you have. Most people don't have the capabilities. Most people don't have the education. Most people don't have the network. Most people don't know how to travel. They know how to travel. You know how? They'll take an organized tour on a bus. 
for a very simple reason. They don't have no idea how to travel internationally. Okay? They don't have the resources. They don't know how to do it. So you're asking why you're more successful? Well, that is the reason, because you, all of you have those skills. You have developed them. Your parents taught you. You yourself developed them. Okay? And so basically, what is happening in Europe is because the, the um, movement of people and services is now open, more and more people are able to travel. But still, those that are educated, they're the ones who can benefit most of it. Media.